So I'm a paleoecologist and what I do is try to reconstruct um, how environments have changed over periods of thousands of years, mostly focusing on the Holocene, the last 10,000 years or so, um, with a view to trying to understand how ecosystems respond to things like climate change, how they respond to human activity, and also what um, past vegetation cover in terms of land use can tell us about what people um, were doing in the past as well. So I said I'm a paleoecologist. Um, if you're not sure what that is, paleoecology literally means um, old ecology. Paleo means old. Um, and it's about reconstructing past environments, past ecosystems, um, past ecological processes, and also human activity, as I mentioned, and seeing how these things vary um, in response to things like climate change, how ecosystems are affected by that, um, and how people and environments have interacted um, over time as well. So the data um, for how we reconstruct past environments comes from primarily wet places. So places, places like peat bogs, um, lakes, lake sediments that accumulate at the bottom of a lake, they all preserve organic remains that can tell us something about the environment, what the environment was like at the time that those organic remains were laid down. Um, we refer to these wet places as, as a sedimentary archive quite often. How that forms, um, so here's our lake. Um, in this case, it could equally be a peat bog. And we have layers of sediment that accumulate over hundreds, often thousands of years. Um, so over a period of time, you get layers of sediment building up in these wet environments, be they lakes, be they peat bogs. Within those sediments, you get all sorts of um, interesting things preserved. So primarily microfossils um, preserved within the sediments building up a picture of how the environment has changed over time. And we can come along, we can take a core through, this is one of the slides I use for teaching undergrads. <laughs> and this, we can take a core through um, these layers of sediment that have built up over time. We can analyze the microfossils that are preserved within them at different layers, and we can build up a picture of how the environment has changed over that time period. This all rests on the basic principle of uniformitarianism, so the present is the key to the past. So we basically assume that the same natural laws and processes that are operating today have always operated in the past. So the subfossil assemblages um, that we find preserved within the sediment subsamples that we take from our core are a function of the ecosystem that was present when the sediment was deposited. So we use what we call proxy records um, so these um, provide an indirect measure of former climates or environments. They're not a direct measurement, like a thermometer measurement of past temperature or whatever, but they are something that responds to temperature. Uh, if we know how those organisms respond to temperature, we can translate that into temperature if that's what we're interested in reconstructing. So they're proxy records that we use. Um, in terms of the kinds of proxies that we get, <coughs> So they're primarily organic sediments that we use, things that form at the bottom of lakes or in peat bogs. Um, but you occasionally get mineral remains washing into those environments. So you can tell something about soil erosion, perhaps, from that. And we analyze that through a process called loss on ignition, where we basically burn off all the organic matter and measure what's left behind. Um, we also get the remains of algae called uh, particularly diatoms preserved in sediments. Um, they produce a silica kind of shell called a frustule which is what ends up preserved in the sediment. From that, we can identify different species. They respond in various ways to things like um, pH, nutrient status of water bodies, salinity as well. So we can use them to reconstruct sea level changes in coastal environments. Um, they also have specific climate preferences. So sometimes they can tell us something about climate as well. Um, but they can tell us particularly about water quality in the past as well. Um, we can get information about what animals might have been present um, in the landscape through stuff that animals leave behind, primarily dung. Um, dung provides a habitat for things like fungi and beetles, and we get um, remains of beetles, particularly the wing cases preserved in sediments. We also get fungal spores from the fungi that may have been growing on the dung. So from these proxies, we can tell something about animals um, in the landscape. Other proxies, um, we can tell something about past fires, be they wildfires or be they, be they deliberate anthropogenic fires. Fires produce soot. 
microscopic charcoal becomes preserved in sediments, we can analyze this and get some quantification of fire intensity um, over time, fire frequency. Um, plants, they have things like seeds and leaves, which are again preserved in the sediments. We can identify these quite often to species level and tell something about the vegetation that was around. And the proxy that I use mainly um, in combination with some of these other things quite often, but mainly I look at pollen and spores, again produced by plants. We can analyze the pollen and spores preserved in the sediments, work out how the vegetation has changed um, over the time period that we're looking at. So you analyze the pollen at different levels um, in the sediment, and typically we produce something like this, a pollen diagram. Um, this is one of the ones I produced for my PhD from Orkney. And this is a summary, believe it or not. So it, it's really densely packed. It's got a lot of information in there. It's quite difficult to interpret if you're not used to interpreting these things. Um, and this is probably only about a quarter of all the taxa that I identified. So this is a summary version of it. So trying to interpret these things, you present these to people who are interested in past land cover data, like maybe archaeologists or modern ecologists or conservation managers, and they're not easy to interpret and work out what's going on. Quite often, um, what people who, are, who would use pollen data are interested in is quantified estimates of the vegetation that was there. Perhaps even something like a map of past vegetation cover. So that's something that's much more accessible and easy to interpret if you're not an expert in palynology, for instance. So to address this gap between what people who use pollen data might want and what people who produce pollen data produce, you need to try and translate these pollen assemblages into quantified estimates of past vegetation. That isn't straightforward um, because different plant species produce different amounts of pollen they have different methods for dispersing their pollen, so some travels over greater distances than others. So there are all sorts of things that make it complicated translating the pollen into the vegetation. You can't simply say, okay, I've got 20% oak pollen in my core, therefore there was 20% oak in the woodland. The pollen percentages can't also tell you about the spatial arrangement of vegetation. So if you've got a woodland, where was it? Was it close to your site? Was it quite far away from your site? How big was it? Was it one patch of woodland? Was it several patches of woodland in a mosaic of other vegetation types? So the pollen diagram, as it is, as densely packed as it is with information, maybe isn't that useful in actually quantifying what the landscape and the vegetation looked like. So we have a mathematical model. Um, that I won't go into the details of, but if you want to know about it, you can ask me later. Um, essentially, this model kind of corrects for the differences in pollen productivity and dispersal and allows you to translate those pollen percentages into quantified estimates of vegetation abundance around your pollen site. And there are two main approaches to reconstructing vegetation, which both use this same underlying model. The one that I use most is called the multiple scenario approach, and it uses that mathematical model, the prentice Sagita model, um, to produce spatially explicit quantified reconstructions of past vegetation. So the way the method works, um, you start with what you know about. So you start with your pollen assemblages from various sites in the landscape. So say this is our landscape we want to reconstruct. We've got two pollen sites where people have taken cores, got pollen data from. You take the aspects of the environment, which you can fairly confidently model for the past. So things like topography, geology, things that you would expect to influence the distribution of vegetation communities. And you come up with some vegetation communities that you think would have been present based on the pollen assemblages you've got. And you come up with some distribution rules based on what you know about the ecology of those plants and those communities in the modern day. So that's what we start with. You then come up, you combine those distribution rules. So you say, OK, um, let's vary the tree line between, say, 200 and 400 metres. Let's make um, 
100% of southwest facing slopes wooded and 80% of those slopes wooded, 60%. So you can combine the range of values for distribution and place communities into suitable locations in the landscape in different proportions. And you can produce tens and thousands of different hypothetical vegetation maps. You then use that calibrated model of pollen dispersal and deposition to produce simulated pollen assemblages at the places where you actually have real data from to compare them to. And then you employ a statistical test of similarity um, between your actual empirical pollen data and your simulated pollen assemblages, and that allows you to come up with some likely reconstructions of past vegetation. So that's the method um, that I've been working with primarily. So I'll talk you through a couple of case studies of how we've applied this method um, in different archaeological landscapes. So the first one I'm going to talk to you about is Orkney. Um, so this is where I did my PhD, that's me, um, about, God, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago at least, probably, taking one of my calls from Orkney. Um, still working on that data and still getting mileage out of it, which is great. <laughs> um, we chose, so this work was done as part of a much larger pro project um, led by an archaeologist called Alistair Whittle, and um, he works at Cardiff University, and Alex Bayliss, who works for Historic England. It was an ERC-funded project, and they were trying to produce very precise chronologies um, for Neolithic settlement across Europe. But they also wanted to know something about the environments and the landscapes that these people inhabited, so that's where we came in. Um, we chose Orkney um, as one of our case studies, partly because it has a really exceptional kind of quality of Neolithic archaeological remains. I don't know if anyone's ever seen any documentaries on Orkney, but they're always on TV. Um, this is a settlement called Barn House. I say settlement, but it's not really like many other Neolithic settlements. It's really big. The buildings were really monumental. They think it probably had some kind of ceremonial purpose. So there's a lot of Neolithic archaeology. It wasn't particularly well dated prior to this project. Um, I didn't do anything to help refine that. That was other people's job. Um, but there's also been quite a lot of paleoecological work done over the years, um, quite a bit of it by me for my PhD. So it seemed like an ideal site to apply this method to. Oh, sorry, I should have pointed out. I'm going to talk in a minute about core and peripheral areas. So the core area is this bit here, which is where this barn house site is. There's lots of other ceremonial monuments in this region. And then the peripheral area is the rest of the big island, mainland, in the middle of the archipelago. So um, the project started. This was other people's bit of it. They collated um, all the Neolithic dates from archaeological contexts on mainland Orkney. And they used them to produce, um, they used Bayesian chronological modelling to produce individual site-based chronologies for each of the settlements and monuments. So, for example, this is another site in that core region in the middle. Um, this is the Ness of Brodka, which you may have seen um, if you've ever watched any programmes about archaeology in the last 10 years. It's another really important, probably high-status ceremonial site. Um, so then they combined those individual site-based chronologies to produce this figure on the right-hand side, which is basically an estimate of settlement intensity from 3,500 to 2,200 BC. The red bits are in that core area where all the ceremonial monuments are. The blue bits are in what they call the periphery, the rest of mainland, the big island in the middle. What that figure basically shows um, is that from about 3,150 to about 2,850 BC, um, there was a kind of increase in settlement nucleation across mainland Orkney. So at this time, they saw the creation of um, identifiable villages across the island. The majority of those sites seem to have been abandoned here around 2,800 BC. And then there was a kind of spatial shift in settlement. So a lot of the settlements in the periphery were then reoccupied and reused, whereas in the core area, that didn't happen. So there's differences in what's happening in the, in the core kind of ceremonial part and in the wider big mainland island. 
And then the Neolithic villages across mainland were abandoned here around 2400 BC. So our job was then to try and provide some environmental context for what was going on. What was the landscape like that people were inhabiting? Um, what, in what ways were they potentially modifying it? And, <coughs> excuse me, and using it. So we modelled the vegetation in 200-year time slices. Um, unfortunately, you can't get the same chronological resolution from paleo data as you can from the archaeological. So they had 25-year time slices. We had to work with 200. And this is due to the way that pollen cores are typically sampled. So a centimetre of sediment is typically what you would use. That could be tens of years' worth of accumulation. So you just can't get the same sort of chronological resolution. But I don't actually think that matters. Um, I'll explain why in a moment. <laughs> so we modelled land cover as essentially a mosaic of grassland um, with birch hazel woodland patches across it. This is what we typically think the landscape was like. We also had more diverse woodland with oak and pine as well. And what we called a disturbed land community, which contains weeds that are typical of disturbance. So they could have been there due to natural processes. Um, Orkney is quite a dynamic landscape, particularly around the coasts. So there could have been natural disturbance taking place. They could have also been there because people were there doing small scale um, agriculture. And for our first modelling run, we did quite a lot of, quite a broad range of options. So we modelled everything from zero woodland cover to 100% woodland cover. And within that, we had a range of options for the more diverse woodland, um, for a heathland community as well, and for that disturbed land category. Then we used the, we did it at quite broad intervals, 20% woodland cover, I think, um, were the intervals we used. And then we took the best fit ranges that we found from that initial run and narrowed it down and narrowed it down until we eventually came up with some plausible reconstructions. So this is the earliest time slice that we modeled. This is prior to any dated Neolithic settlement activity. And at that time, you can see the landscape's dominated by um, a grassland community. There's a little bit of woodland. And there are, you can't really see it because they're yellow um, against pale green. But there is some disturbed ground present, so presumably due to natural processes. Moving on to um, 3600 to 3400 BC, this is when we have the first clear dated evidence of Neolithic activity um, on mainland. And at this point, there is an increase in our disturbed land community of about 800 hectares. And we are interpreting this kind of increase above that natural baseline as being perhaps reflecting the beginnings of cereal cultivation by these first settlers in Orkney. Going a bit later, 2800 to 2600, so that's just after that late Neolithic abandonment of settlements um, in the core ceremonial area. Woodland cover's declined quite a bit by this point, but the coverage of disturbed land is comparable to in the earlier time slice. So although settlements in that core area seem to have been abandoned, that's not reflective of kind of, I guess, population almost. People were clearly still there doing stuff in the landscape at that time. So they hadn't just gone somewhere else. They'd maybe just moved on, as we saw, moved to other areas of the island. So rather than show you a map of every time slice, because we modeled 10 of them, um, this graph shows you woodland cover, the gray bars, and then it's overlaid on that figure of settlement intensity. So the red is the core area, the green is the peripheral area. And basically what it shows is there's relatively high woodland cover um, up to about this point when we have the first ne Neolithic settlement activity and then woodland cover kind of halves at that point. So we again interpret that as perhaps being indicative of people coming in um, and clearing what little woodland already remained at this point. And then there's a further reduction in woodland cover um, in the sort of 26th century BC here. Even though that settlement intensity is clearly lower at that point. So again, backing up this idea that although people weren't using these settlements anymore, they were still there. They were still having an impact on the landscape. They were still there doing stuff, whatever that stuff might have been. 
That's the same figure, um, but rather than for woodland cover, it's for the disturbed ground category. So again, you can see that becomes more extensive as settlement becomes more intensive. So this shows the increase in disturbed ground above the baseline that we established for natural conditions um, prior to settlement. And we're attributing those increases to human activity. If they are due to human activity, then we seem to have some before our first clear dated evidence for settlement. Um, that's not completely um, impossible because it's not likely that we found every single settlement in Orkney and dated everything that we could have dated. So they're probably Neolithic pioneers or the remains of late Mesolithic hunter-gatherer communities, perhaps. The increase in house use seen here um, is associated with quite a distinct increase in disturbed ground coverage in the land cover data. And it's quite interesting that the abandonment of Neolithic houses in both the core region and the peripheral region isn't associated with any clear reduction um, in land cover. So even in this final time slice, the transition from Neolithic to Bronze Age, there's still quite a lot of activity in the wider landscape. So it's probable that this settlement activity just hasn't been detected archaeologically yet. So it's often been suggested um, that the difference in chronological resolution between archaeological and paleo data might hinder integrating those two data sets together. Um, but actually, I think our work in Orkney shows that that's not the case. Even though they're quite different resolutions, they're showing the same general trends and patterns over time. And we're actually suggesting, and I'll go on to demonstrate this again in a moment, that anthropogenic land cover could be used as a proxy for settlement activity in areas where we don't have um, the dated archaeological evidence to provide it. We are suggesting that we might be able to use the MSA results as a driver for future archaeological research. So for instance, that late Neolithic, early Bronze Age increase, that final time slice where disturbed land cover increases quite significantly, why is that not visible in the archaeological record? Um, the Bronze Age in Orkney has often been argued to be a period of decline. Um, but the one archaeologist who works in Orkney on Bronze Age stuff um, is fairly convinced that's not true and thinks that actually we've just failed to recognize Bronze Age archaeology. Um, it's there, and we've just interpreted it as something else. And it's never been properly radiocarbon dated, so we don't know when it actually dates to. So perhaps the, the land cover data kind of adds something to that suggestion. As an example of somewhere where we might use anthropogenic land cover as a proxy for settlement activity, um, I'm going to just briefly talk you through another case study that we used in this project, um, Somerset Levels and Moors in southwest England. So this is an area where there's a lot of archaeological data, but nothing really for settlement. There's lots of wooden trackways, so it's an extensive wetland area, and there's lots of these wooden trackways that cross the wetlands presumably because the wetlands would have provided important resources for people that they needed to access. But we don't know where they were living. We don't know what they were doing, apart from the fact that at some point they went into these wetlands to get stuff, presumably. And there's a lot of paleo data from sites like West Hay Moor, which is a raised bog. So again, lots of archaeological evidence, lots of paleoecological evidence, but no clear indication from the archaeology of where people actually lived. So again, we modeled the vegetation here in 200 year time slices. Just quickly, this is a map of the pre Neolithic time slice. So in southwest England, the Neolithic is thought to have started towards the very end um, of the 39th century BC, so around about 3,850 ish. Um, this is what the landscape looked like then in the Somerset levels before people were there. Um, the dryland woodland, so this lighter green, is about 5% open at this time, so the red dots are clearings within that. So that's our natural kind of baseline level of openness. There's different types of woodland on the wetlands. No openings in those, but we know that people were using the wetlands because they built trackways across them. So presumably they were doing something there. 
at the start of the Neolithic. So in Somerset levels, the earliest dated evidence is 3806 to 7 BC. Um, it's very precise because it's dated by dendrochronology from one of the trackways. This is what it looks like then when people first arrive and when people first start doing stuff that we can confidently date. So increase in clearings in the dryland woodland to about 10%, so a doubling over that natural baseline level. Again, no clearance seems to be happening in the wetlands, um, but again, we know that the trackways were in use, so people were there doing things. We're interpreting this increase in clearance as probable clearance for small-scale agriculture on the drylands. You wouldn't have been farming down in the wetlands. That doesn't make any sense. And this is a kind of similar graph to the Orkney ones. It's showing amount of clearance um, over time, over the um, sort of 2,000-ish 2000, yeah, years that we modelled. So this is our baseline level of clearance here in the pre-settlement time slices of about 5%. And then you can see as soon as we start to get initial Neolithic activity here, um, as I said, 306 to 7 um, BC, there's a doubling in the amount of clearance. So we're interpreting that increase in clearance over the natural baseline again as being indicative of people coming in, clearing the land to open it up for farming. The clearances weren't necessarily all for farming. Some were probably a result of woodland management because we know from the wood used for the trackways um, that people were coppicing the trees. So these clearings are probably woodland management, also small scale um, farming, be that pastoral farming or be it arable farming. Um, and then there's a general kind of increase in clearance over time. There are a few other trends that correlate with other things that were going on in Britain across um, at, at various times. So for instance, there's this slight reduction in clearance from 3.2 to 3,000 BC. And several studies have argued actually around this time, there was a kind of temporary abandonment of cereal cultivation um, across particularly Southern Britain. So perhaps this is reflective of that. And again, showing um, a period of kind of social change in, in the Somerset levels and moors. And then after that, it increases again, clearance increases again, highest levels in these two time slices between 2800, 2400 BC. And the latter half of that period um, is also a period of major um, construction, cultural change in the Stonehenge area. So again, trends seem to be following what's happening elsewhere in Britain, which gives us some kind of confidence that maybe what we're seeing um, is actually reflective of human activity. So whether we really can use anthropogenic land use as a proxy for settlement intensity in places where we maybe don't have the archaeological evidence to provide that is probably little more than speculation at this stage. But because these trends in Somerset correlate with trends that we know from archaeological data elsewhere in southern England, and because in Orkney, we've shown that the archaeological data and the land cover data match up quite nicely. I think it's probably an avenue that's definitely worth exploring further. Um, to, to sum up, the MSA, the multiple scenario approach, um, it provides us with a new approach for scaling up site-specific paleoenvironmental records to wider, um, bigger spatial and temporal scales, so to the wider landscapes um, within which people were living. You can produce both mapped and quantified estimates of past vegetation cover, um, which is perhaps more useful than a pollen diagram for communicating with people in other disciplines who might want to use your data. And I think I've demonstrated, hopefully, that there is potential um, to actually use quantified vegetation reconstructions as a proxy for settlement intensity in places where we don't have archaeology to provide it, so to perhaps fill in some of the gaps in our knowledge. The approach also embraces um, the idea of equifinality, so you could have multiple ecologically distinct landscapes that all produce the same pollen signal, and that's something that I don't think pollen analysts have always been very good at admitting. They tend to have their favourite interpretation, and that's the one that they go with. But actually, there could be lots of very different landscapes producing the same 
pollen signal, and I think it's quite important to acknowledge that and acknowledge the uncertainty in our reconstructions. It also enables you to construct and test hypotheses as well, um, which is something else I don't think we've always been particularly good at as palynologists. Um, so I think I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you.